Yeah. Now, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all back again today evening. Uh, as far as hand injuries are concerned, it's all very nice to read about them in the book textbooks and uh, learn the theory part of it and even learn the surgical technique. But when you are sitting alone in the casualty or you have been called to see a patient with a hand injury, everything, the equations are different. You are on your own. None of the, unless you have a very strict protocol, you cannot handle the situation. Hand injuries are not major life threatening injuries, but it is important. Yesterday we were talking about the get it right first time concept. That is, you do it right the first time. And that may be a little daunting to a person who is just starting off his practice and seeing a hand injury uh, in his casualty. We'll go to the presentation now. Now, uh, today the agenda is going to be uh, the basics of management of hand injuries. Uh, here it's going to be eliciting the history, examination of the patient and the injured hand, documentation, investigations to ask for, decision making, and lastly we'll finish up with the discussion of today morning, uh, the morning's case of multiple metacarpal fractures. Now, eliciting the history, there are so many points that we need to. I still recommend you uh, seeing or reading the book, uh, Clinical Methods by Das, which is a fantastic <coughs> book as far as examination of the uh, injured hand is concerned. We'll see all these uh, uh, points one by one. Now, the first thing when you get across, when you come across a patient with a hand injury, is to rule out life-threatening injuries. Uh, the legendary Professor Venkat Swami used to say, for every hand injury, you will see, notice that there is a patient attached to it. This was said in very nice humor, but it's got a very important point behind it. When, you, when we see a patient with a hand injury, we are all uh, totally struck by that injury. But what we need to see is the patient as a whole, especially in the case of polytrauma, when hand injuries get the last priority and life-threatening injuries are most important. I keep saying this again and again because I have come across patients, uh, situations where it has been missed. Of course, the life-threatening injuries, I don't have to tell such an uh, educated audience about the lethal six thoracic injuries, the head and spinal cord trauma and abdominal trauma sometimes. Now, coming to the history proper, the first is the age. Now, why is the age so important? The commonest type of injury that would have occurred is very obvious. In children, you have got door crush injuries. And sometimes children, toddlers, put their hand into the uh, motor pump. That's a very common type of injury that we come across. We get rare injuries also in children. Elders, it is falling down and having blunt injuries and fractures. The next point about age is, it is important for physiotherapy. Sometimes, Two elderly age group patients may not be very amenable for physiotherapy, in which case doing complicated procedures of the hand may not be, be very fruitful for them. Then the third is the anesthesia required. Children may, required, may require general anesthesia if it is a major injury or even sedation with local anesthesia. And injuries in minor children may be significant as parental concern may be required. If children are below the uh, consenting uh, uh, age group, it is important. Sometimes very young children are brought with injuries and the company people will be there with them too, ready to give a consent. But that will not stay in court of law and it is also not correct for us to do a surgery on the child without informing the parents about the injury. Now, this is the type of injury that you can get in a child. This is the motor crush injury. The child has uh, toddled to the motor pump and put his uh, thumb into it. Now, look at this. Children sometimes, you know, this is actually a small child for whom I'm doing a suturing. You will find that the child is even looking at it. The important thing is we need to talk to the children. Sometimes children are very understanding. 
they are only scared about the procedure and the masks and the, uh, the theater uh, setup. If you talk to the child, as in this child, the child will be able to understand. The only thing is they'll be scared to lie down. So I made her sit up, put a sterile drape and did the sutureing, did it under local anesthesia. Now the second thing about the sex that has to be uh, ascertained. There are some certain, I may sound a little feminist, but there are certain hand injuries that are commonly seen in women, like domestic mixer machine injuries, contact burns on the hand and forearm sustained while cooking, and punching machine injuries, because women are usually used in the industries for smaller machines, like the molding machine. The plastic molding machine is one such thing. And the second is the tailoring, where they usually come with a retained foreign body, the needle that breaks and is retained in the uh, uh, terminal portion of the finger. In men, of course, you can have assault injuries, which can also be seen in women. Sustained injury, common, uh, common pain on weekends after a binge of alcohol uh, drinking, and they can do it under a fit of rage. And heavy machine injuries and cracker burst injuries, as I was talking to you yesterday. And uh, however, the lists are not exclusive. The third is the occupation. The factory worker, the type of machine that he has sustained the injury on. For instance, today I showed a patient with a fracture, multiple uh, metacarpal fractures. And uh, the comments were that it's most probably a power uh, press injury. That was very correct. Because each machine has its own signature on the hand. And each machine has its own uh, type of injury. We should be prepared for that. Homemakers, school students, infants, as I said, door crush and motor pump. Now, why do we know, need to know the occupation? The important thing is we are going to rehabilitate them back to their work. And so we need to make a treatment plan according to the occupation that should be taken into consideration. And for example, if it is a musical instrument player, we are going to stress and uh, concentrate on getting the finer movements back. While it's a manual laborer, he has to get back early to work. Because it's a, it's a manual laborer, he's the uh, breadwinner of the family, he needs to get back to work earlier and we need to give him the power of the hand. Then hand involved and dominance is also important. It is the same injury occurring on the non-dominant hand may not get the same importance as would be an injury on the dominant hand. And the plan that is going to be given for the non-dominant hand injury may be different according to the patient. The socioeconomic status and the educational status are also important because it talks about their understanding of the problem. Sometimes I have come across patients who are not educationally very high in their status, but they're able to understand. So ultimately it is what the patient is able to understand about the need for therapy, what is going to be done for him. And uh, similarly, we can modify the treatment protocols. For instance, a thumb amputation is a computer professional or a finger amputation in non-dominant hand in a migrant worker. Now, these, you are going to treat the patient. You are going to reconstruct. But the method of reconstruction is going to be different in such a way that he gets back to work at the earliest. The timing of injury within eight hours or more than eight hours, that's all. There's not much of a difference. Within eight hours, we can plan all the reconstruction, repair, that is the tendons, the, the nerve, whatever. If it is more than eight hours, we need to weigh what is the contamination. <clears throat> now we know that the classification of wounds is either tidy or untidy, according to rank and weight field classification. The tidy wounds are clean incised wounds, clean wounds, healthy tissues are uh, involved, and there is seldom any tissue loss. These wounds will uh, need an immediate repair, whereas untidy wounds, where they are crushed or avulsed, they are contaminated, devitalized tissues, often tissue loss. Now, sometimes I hear residents sometimes saying, sir, it is an infected wound and the injury was about uh, three years ago. Now, that is a wrong concept. There is no such thing as an infected wound in an injury which has occurred three years before. Because infection takes time to settle in. What the person is actually meaning is a contaminated wound. 
if contamination we are talking about contamination it means mud uh, road particles dust particles all these are contamination if contaminants can get in they can also get out so the next is the mode of injury now considering the mode of injury industrial accidents form a major portion chunk of hand injuries that we saw in our practice it all depends as i said on the type of machine because some have irregular surfaces like cogs some have weight coming from both sides and sharp blades sometimes and traction conveyor belt injury sometimes now the other types of mode of injury are burns electrical burns road traffic accidents and they have different characteristics now there's one point i wanted to stress here we talk about abrasions and we talk about friction burns are they the same definitely not because both have the same appearance of the wound on the skin but if you see the friction burns they have an extra uh, component of avulsion which is involved or a crush that is involved so the underlying tissues are also involved in friction burns it is not just an abrasion so the amount of scarring that is going to occur following the healing of a friction burns is different than the scarring that occurs after a abrasion and assault wounds can also occur self inflicted wounds and accidental domestic injuries like fingertip injuries nail injuries and domestic kitchen uh, now this is a case of an electrical burn now electrical burns we will see it when you talk about elect burns electrical burns this is an example of a contact burn this child has held a live wire you can see that area of deep eschar on the palm and on the fingers and on the thumb where the burn is very deep the other injuries at the same time we need to rule out other injuries to the same limb there may be proximal injuries there may be injuries to the contralateral limb also which may be slightly lesser importance but they are also important and to other parts of the body and also comorbid factors especially if the patient is elderly now examination of the patient now we have got a good history now we are going to examine the patient the first thing is to make the patient comfortable and lie down we have to stop this uh, thing of making the patient sit up or standing up and trying to examine a small wound the, when you are examining patient can always fall down due to pain shock so we need to make the patient comfortable lie down and then reassure the patient because he is already in pain and we need to take out the dressings he may already have a dressing some dressing which has been applied outside we need to take it down we can do it by pour by pouring saline soak and then remove it then we can wash with saline we need to pour with saline pour saline then after it's wet it has to be removed there is no point in causing pain to the patient while removing the dressings he loses his confidence in you and if there is a bleeding a general pre a gentle pressure with a gauze will suffice to stop the bleeding if there is going to be excessive bleeding we need to apply a tourniquet immediately sometimes it may, a tourniquet may not be available in the place in the outpatient clinic or in the emergency casualty where the patient is being seen but a bp cuff will always be there we just apply the bp cuff raise the pressure up to 300 mm of mercury by raising the pressure we always think it is may be painful but all patients can withstand this pressure for up to 10 to 15 minutes so we are going to apply it only to examine where exactly the bleeding is once the bleeding you are able to see where the bleeding is we need to apply what is known as the johnson method of pressure dressing that is right over the wound you are able to apply see a point where the bleeding is occur occurring now people have got a tendency to push in their artery forceps to catch the bleeder it is not ideal to do that because if it is a deep bleeding usually the nerves may be involved what we need to do is just apply a few gauze pieces one on top of each other exactly where the bleeding is occurring about four or five gauze pieces lined up one over the other then a single pad and then a bandage hand elevation this will definitely stop the bleeding the tourniquet can be released and the patient can be taken up for surgical management now once we go to the proper examination of the hand we need to see the position attitude 
Before that, we need to see whether any loss of parts. This is the most important thing because amputation is an important part of hand injury and this is usually recorded first. Any amputation is recorded first. Then we see the deformity, shortening, angulation and the position. Now look at this uh, x-ray, this picture. You can see the deformity there on the uh, uh, index finger. That uh, correlates with a fracture. This must be noted and we should suspect the diagnosis when we send the patient out for the x-ray. Now look at this deformity, it can occur at a higher level also. There is a fracture. As you know, we need to look for a radial nerve injury at this, in this patient. Now, then after seeing the position of the hand and looking at the uh, wounds, we have to come to the wounds now. They can be either closed wounds or open wounds. Closed wounds, of course, will come mainly with a swelling. And open wounds can be amputation. As I said, any amputation comes first. This, again, in the examination of the wound, the amputation comes first. Abrasions, incised wounds, crush injury, avulsion injury. These are the different types of injuries that can occur on the skin. This should be noted. And, of course, the level of contamination should also be noted, as we have seen. Now, this is a picture showing the amputation of the fingers. You can also see at the edges of the amputated part, you can make out that there is a crush element. So this also should be taken into account while planning the treatment protocol for this patient. The next is this sort of patient. Now, the, when you see this, sort, this is a partial amp. What you saw first was a total amputation. Now, this is, this is what is called as a partial amputation. The tissues are still attached, but the distal part is non-viable. So this is called a partial amputation. Now, these patients also should be examined. We will be seeing the vascularity also, but now the wound must be noted. Now, look at this. This is a simple injury on the dorsum of the hand, but you can make out the crush element to the skin. If we go ahead and do an extensor repair of this, you will find it difficult to get a good skin cover. That may be a problem. So this should be noted in the primary examination itself. Now look at this patient who has had a degloving. This is another type of injury to the skin. We have seen incised wounds, we have seen slicing wounds, we have seen crush wounds, and we have seen amputations. Now this is a type of a degloving injury where the skin is totally degloved, like a, it is removed like a glove. And this occurs at the level of the subcutaneous tissues. So you will find that the entire musculoskeletal system is intact. As a matter of fact, at the level of the palm, you can even see the palmar the remnants of the palmar aponeurosis. Now, this is another injury which is, it looks very innocuous. But on exploration, actually, it was there was a, it was non-viable. Their hand was non-viable, and there was an injury to the median nerve. And on exploration, there was a extensive injury to the underlying structures, namely the biceps muscle, the median nerve, the brachial artery, and the cephalic vein. Now, these innocuous injuries also should be taken into account and should be recorded. The first point to record up while going for the examination of the hand is what is the vascularity? Is it viable? Once it is viable, we can go ahead with the next plan. But without seeing this, there is absolutely no point in going ahead. Now, how do we assess the loss of vascularity? A lot of people say we'll do a Doppler. Now, a Doppler only measures the main blood flow in the main vessels but it does not assess the blood flow in the smaller vessels that is the main. I always liken it to a, a water lorry going on the main road. Water lorries are going on the main road, but what is the aim of these water lorries is to provide water to the small villages, which are fed by small roads. If the lorry cannot enter that small road, the villages will not get the water, but there are plenty of lorries on the road. So we need to assess the viability on the tip of the finger or on the distal part. So how do we assess it? We've got certain criteria, basic criteria, very simple criteria, the color. Now, a lot of people say the color, how can we assess the color in dark skin people? Definitely not. We can assess the color in dark skin people also. 
and especially the nail can be examined. It should be pink in color. If it is pale in color, there is an arterial problem. If it is congested or very pink in color, it means it is a venous problem. Now, we can next see the warmth. Gently touch it and feel the warmth. Warmth is also a recognizable problem. You can make it out. Sometimes if it is cold, you can make out, compare it with the neighboring fingers or the other hand. Sometimes you may not be able to make out whether it's warm, but what you need to do is compare it to the next finger or the other hand. You'll be able to make out the difference. Then the turgor of the finger, that is also important. And the capillary refill or nail blanching on gentle pressure to the nail. And if all these are still equivocal, you can always do a needle prick or a stab with the tip of the 11 blade, number 11 size blade. You will see a bleeding. Now this bleeding also should be noted, whether it starts immediately, whether it is dark colored or uh, uh, red colored, bright red, and what is the rate of flow. Sometimes when you make a streak or you may needle prick, the blood will start flowing out. That means it is a venous problem. The venous drainage is not adequate. So all the blood comes out through this release point of your needle prick. So these points must be made to assess the vascularity. If all these are also a problem, you can also use the technique of uh, the uh, pulse oximeter to measure. Now this is an injury. Here, there is a major injury. There is a major injury to the thumb. You can make out that there is a deformity and the x-ray shows a fracture, but the thumb looks viable. This is what I was saying. You can even make out on this picture that the thumb looks viable because it is pink in color. Now, this is another injury where the hand looks very pink and viable. Now, even though it looks very similar to the patient that we saw earlier, so it is not that this sort of injury should have a non-viable limb. It is only that you need to assess each patient on an individual basis. Now look at these fingers. You can make out that they are non-viable. Especially you can look at this finger. It looks, it looks sort of empty and pale. Now these are indications that these fingers are not viable. So as I said, you can also use the pulse oximeter. You can make out that this finger is looking a little bad. There is a fracture there. Now, this fracture, normally, we would not expect a non-viable finger. But here, it has occurred. Now, it is not dependent on the fracture that you see. It is dependent on the injury, that, on the, uh, the force that caused the injury. The same force can cause a non-viable finger, finger, and the same force can also leave a viable non-viable finger. So now, assessment can be done with a pulse oximeter also. Now, we have seen the vascularity of the finger hand and we have seen it is good. Now we go and see the movements. We need to check the movements both active and passive. Is he able to do the movements? Sometimes my uh, residents would say, sir, we are not able to assist because of pain. Usually that is not a problem. They can, there will be some restriction due to the pain, but the, you can make out the movement. Some patients may be a little apprehensive but you need to cajole them gently and so that you can check the movements. We need to check it on the flexor side and the extensor side. And you also need to check for abnormal movements that can occur. Especially when you're checking the passive movement, you may note some abnormal movements which indicate some underlying fracture. Now, there is a quick check, Dr. Professor Sridhar uh, would, uh, usually tells us this. Ask for opposition movement. Ask him to oppose the fingers. If he's able to do that, his median nerve is good. Ask him to override the middle and ring fingers like this. Cross the index and uh, mid fingers, his ulnar nerve is good. So this is just a quick check. So here you can make out, this is a young doctor who had an injury in a multiple glass piece injury. You can make out a very innocuous wound on the index finger. But on asking him to flex the fingers, we found that he was not able to flex the index finger. And we found on exploration that both the flexor digitum superficialis and profundus were cut at zone 2 in this uh, finger. Now, this is a zone 5. We'll be talking about the flexor zones when you're talking about the flexor uh, injuries. But this is another injury where, which is 
uh, got, uh, you can see the fingers are all out of cascade. So the active movements are not present. And this is another injury where the, all the fingers are out of cascade and there is no flexion at all. And it is typically a zone three or four level. Now, look at this patient. He doesn't have any external wound. But on asking him to do the movements, we find that there is no active movement of flexion at the inter distal interphalangeal joint of the right hand ring finger. Now, this suggests that there has been an avulsion injury of the flexor disturbance profundus, which is also quite a common injury. Unless we look for these movements, you will, we will miss the diagnosis. And now we come to the examination of the nerves. We have seen the musculoskeletal system. Now we come to the nerves. We need to check the sensation. We've already checked the muscles and that will give us a clue about the nerve injuries. We need to check the sensation. One important point that I have noted is if you ask the patient, are you able to feel sensation? They will invariably say yes. Now that is very important because uh, unless they are very intelligent, they cannot tell you there is a slight blunting of sensation. So here, this is one situation in hand surgery where we ask leading questions. You can ask them, are you able to feel the sensation? We usually compare with the other hand which, if it is not injured. We touch the same, you can, touch the, you can uh, touch the tip of the thumb on both sides, ask them if there is, it is the same or is the slight difference. They will immediately say there is a slight difference if they have an injury to the nerve. And the sensation on the tip of the index finger or the middle finger for the median nerve and tip of the little finger for the ulnar nerve and on the dorsal aspect of the thumb web for the radial nerve. Now, the other question that people have asked me is, when there is an injury to the ulnar nerve, will there be a claw hand immediately? You, I'll show you the picture to show that. Now, this is a, an injury to the arm. He had an uh, injury to the radial nerve. And you can make out on the clinical, after the wound healed also, he's got a radial nerve palsy. Now, look, this is an injury with a knife. Now, typically, you can make out the ulnar, nerve, ulnar claw that has occurred. So you will note that immediately after an injury to the ulnar nerve, you will have an ulnar claw that develops. This may develop in almost 80% of the patients. There are some patients, especially those with stubby hands, short stubby fingers, and uh, small uh, square shaped hands, where the soft tissue support is quite high. Those patients may not manifest the claw immediately. But invariably, when the soft tissues give up, you, the claw will manifest. So this can be seen. Now, having examined the patient, we need to document it. I have seen that most of the problems occur because documentation has not been correct. The documentation could, should be written. It should be written with the name of the examining doctor, the date and time. This is very important. It must contain the detailed history, the cause of the injury, the side involved, the type of the injury, the clinical examination findings, and findings and relevant investigations, and the diagnosis. Documentation can also include photographic and videographic recording. Now, the investigation that we ask for, the basic investigation that we're going to ask for is an X-ray. We usually ask for PA and oblique views. Now, these views will show us the fractures. Now, there are some special X-rays. For instance, stress X-rays on the thumb, metacarpophalangeal joint, to uh, look for skier's thumb or uh, uh, injury to the ulnar collateral ligament of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Now, what do we look for in the X-rays? We look for the fractures. We look for dislocations. We look for the soft tissue injuries also. And the other investigations that we do are blood investigations for screening and for anesthesia purposes. <clears throat> now we come to the decision making. We have got a good history from the patient. We have done a thorough clinical examination. We have noted that, <clears throat> sorry, we have noted that he has got a good vascularized uh, limb. There is no problem of vascularity. And we are able to make out some injuries to the tendons or nerve or whatever, skin loss, whatever. And now the time has come 
to make a decision. This can be, we can arrive at a decision only by talking to the patient. We need to talk to the patient, talk to his attender also. Agreed that the patient and the attender may not know much about the options, but it is our duty to tell them. It is not necessary to tell all the options available in the textbook for the management of a particular problem. We need to take a basic decision. I know I, this may be controversial, but I generally break it down, make it down into two or three small plans and then talk to the patient and involve him in the decision making. We have to talk to the patient about the findings that we are seeing and show him for instance, you tell him that this finger, the tendon has been cut, flexor tendon, you can show him, demonstrate it to the patient and the attender. We need to talk to them about the proposed plan and the options. If this plan is going to be done, how long is it going to take for him to get back to work? Because that is top, on the top most uh, priority of the, uh, on their minds. When will they get back to work? So what to expect? When will they get back to work? When will it start function normally? How long will it take? And what must he do? What is his role? What complications can occur? And the importance of therapy. This is very important. We need to impress upon the patient the importance of therapy at this primary setting itself. Now, as far as decision making is concerned, there are certain things that are very simple. This, for example, in this patient, definitely you can't replant these uh, crushed tissues. It's not possible. This definitely we can replant. And uh, there is no question about it. The decision is making, taken immediately. But the questions come in these sort of situations where you have a thumb tip that has been amputated or there has been an avulsion of all the tendons and the hand looks okay. Now, should we replant it or not? And the next is this sort of avulsion injury. You can make out that it is bluish in color. We were just talking about the vascularity. Now this looks bluish, so most probably it is a venous problem. So we need to reconstitute the venous drainage to make it survive. Now is it worth doing it? Will it work? Now these are certain questions that uh, are, come to our mind. But we need to remember that we need not take a, a dwell, dwell much about it. Our duty is to put it back. We were able to do it in these patients and we got good results. So this shows that you can put it back and it must be, as a matter of fact, it must be put back so that you can do justice to the injury that the patient has sustained. So decision making should, should result in one, are we going to manage it conservatively? For instance, small wounds can be managed conservatively with just dressings. A major wound needs an operative management. If it is going to be an operative management, is it going to be a daycare or an inpatient treatment? Or if it is an operation management, operative management, what is going to be the plan of management? If there is a skin loss, what is going to be the flap? What sort of flap? When is it going to be done? And it is important to, after taking the decision, to communicate this decision that has been taken Along with the patient and the attender, it must be communicated to the patient and attender that this is what is going to be done. So now, having taken a decision, we need to go into the surgical technique and preparation for surgery and then the surgical technique, which I think we shall continue tomorrow. And now, we will finish off with the discussion of today's case. Now, the, uh, the pictures of a male patient of about 25 years who presented with injuries sustained on the non-dominant left hand in an industrial accident of uh, a few hours duration. The questions were, what is the diagnosis? How would you plan the management? And if you are planning an open reduction, what incisions would you make? And what would be your follow-up protocol for this patient? This, uh, these were the pictures that were shown. You can make out, I was just talking to you about the power press uh, injury. You can make out the impression of the machine on the dorsum of the hand, the amount of edema that has set in, the deformities that you can make out, and the impression on the palmar side also with a small laceration. 
it's just a small laceration but the x-rays show all the fractures uh, all the metacarpals have been fractured at the level of the shaft now this uh, uh, posting today uh, evoked a lot of response from uh, our friends in the LGS and there was a lot of discussion and uh, uh, the questions that were asked were what is the diagnosis and how would you plan the management and uh, what would be the institutions and what would be a follow-up protocol. Now the problems in this particular patient as we found in the discussion was this patient has got multiple metacarpal fractures and, and there is a dorsal crush wound which is also important. We were talking about examination of the viability of the hand and fingers. It is also important to examine the viability of the skin. Here this important point came up, this dorsal crush wound. Most of the people who analyzed this, uh, this uh, case were dwelling on this point. What about the vascularity of the fingers? And then, were there any other structures involved? Would it be good to fix it or not to fix? And if it is a plan to fix, do we need to, what is the method of fixation? Do we need to put plate and screws or do we need to put K wires? And what would be the post operative protocol? Now, basically, uh, this hand was. By uh, the fingers were viable. But this dorsal crush these multiple metacarpal fractures. When there are multiple fractures, it is better to fix the fractures. The second is marginal metacarpal fractures. So if the second metacarpal or the fifth metacarpal is fractured, it is better to fix those metacarpals. Or if there is an open wound with metacarpal fractures, it is better to fix those fractures. Here, it is a blunt injury, but since all metacarpals are fractured, we made a plan of fixing the fractures. Now, having decided to fix it, we need to plan whether it's going to be K wires or mini plate and screws. Mini plate and screws have got a fantastic result because they allow us early mobilization. But the important thing to remember uh, my take on this is that when we use mini plate and screw screws, the soft tissue cover is very important. Move the periosteum when you're going to put in the plate and screws. When we do that, the healing of the metacarpals is going to be lesser. We need to remember that bones heal not only from the periosteum but also the surrounding soft tissues. Here, the, by the look of the wound, you will see intraoscular muscles have also been injured. So there is a bit soft tissue for the healing. In this sort of patient, I would prefer to put in K wires and fix these. So these are simpler uh, uh, method of fixation, and you do not, but you do not get a rigid fixation like you do with a mini plate. And we will have to immobilize the hand for about minimum of three weeks before we start mobilizing. Now, having planned to do K wire fixation, we need to now see what would be the approach. Whether we're going to approach it from the dorsal side or are we going to approach it from the volar side? There was a discussion about this too. Some one or two people they prefer to do a volar approach fixation. I don't know. I have always found that the dorsal approach is better because the bones are subcutaneous, just under the tendon. And it is usually in these sort of injuries. The tendons, especially the flexor tendons or the extensor tendons, they are usually intact. I have seen when these injuries, they strike the their injuries. When the weight of the press falls on the hand, the pressure is released through one tissue. If the skin has not breached, been breached to a great extent, all the pressure has been taken away by the bones. So when the fractures occur, the soft tissues are dispared. So in this patient, I would prefer to do a dorsal approach. Having done a planned a dorsal approach, there is one issue to be considered here that the skin that appears crushed. Usually, 
for four metacarpal fractures, we make two incisions, one between the second and third metacarpal and one between the fourth and fifth metacarpal and fix all four metacarpals. But here, if we are going to make two incisions like that, there's another skin that is crushed over there, which may have a problem, which may give problems later on. So here, we thought of doing a transverse approach. This is totally uh, different. It is not that prescribed. But since this patient had an area of skin uh, injury, we plan to do it. I'll show you the results uh, uh, following this. We did the transverse approach. We excised that skin that was crushed. And through that, after opening it up, we fixed the fractures. Now, Metacarpal fracture fixation is usually without impinging on the metacarpophalangeal joint. But here, you note there are four metacarpals that are fractured. If you're going to pass all the K-wires proximally, they're all going to crowd because all the metacarpals are diverging and converging proximally. So all the K-wires would converge. It would be very difficult to put in a wire or put in the drill to pass it. So here, we plan to fix it distoproximally. You drive it distally then drive it proximally and fix the metacarpal. So, and we planned for a post-operative protocol because we have not done a rigid fixation. We planned for a K-wire fixation. We would give a POP for three weeks. After three weeks, we would assess the healing. This healing can be assessed, healing of the fractures. We would be assessing by the clinical and radiological signs. The clinical sign would be uh, if there is no tenderness at the point of fracture, it means that reasonable clinical healing has occurred. X-rays may not show the callus. It may show the callus or may not show. But X-rays will also show you the good bone-to-bone -bone contact. You can remove the K-wires at the end of three weeks. Or you can delay it for another one week and remove the K-wires at four weeks. After four weeks, we... We need to still support both the yin and the yang of therapy. After the POP is taken off, it is not just mobilization. You may need to immobilize and mobilize. So I would immobilize the hand still, but the metacarpophalangeal joints will be moved. Now this was the injury and the fracture. So now, as I told you, we excise that uh, skin loss and through this, we were able to lift the skin and fix the fractures with meta the metacarpal fractures with K wires. And this is the fixation immediately. And here you can make out that all, all the metacarpal joints are kept in 90 degree flexion. And uh, done in a POP. So this is the late flexion on the ring and little fingers but extension is almost full. You can make out the narrowing of the palm. This occurs because of the loss of the intrinsic muscles. They have all been crushed and they have all been uh, fibrosed or lost. And this is the late post-op uh, x-ray of the hand showing well-healed fractures. There are some slight uh, uh, deformity. Is, but the function, yes. So that's it about uh, uh, clinical examination and uh, the uh, discussion of the case of today. Now, are there any questions? I don't know. Have, a, have anybody asked questions? Yeah, uh, actually, the uh, somebody can raise their hand if there's any question. When I, one of them are, uh, their videos are off, actually. I'll just unmute them. But it's a very exhaustive uh, lecture, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, any, uh, very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I have a question. No, I'll do one thing. I'll uh, yeah, mute all of them and then unmute you. Sorry. Children making noise. 
नहीं तो आप क्या है जैसे मुस्लिम होंगे मिलेंगे नमाज पढ़ पढ़ होंगे यानी कितों को उन्होंने इन्फेक्ट किया है मुश्किल हो जाएगा तो आप भी कोई मुस्लिम आ या कोई वैसा हो भले ही साफ सुथरा हो गया तो एक तो इस समय किसी को ज्यादातर घर पे आने ही मत दो now that would actually come in another chapter but since you asked it now i'll just tell you the first thing is when a part has been brought what is the time at which the amputation occurred okay now usually if the part has muscle it should be replanted within 6 hours because muscles will undergo irreversible necrosis by 6 hours so for instance if the amputation has been at the level of the arm okay then you need to put it back within 6 hours if it is the finger it doesn't matter 6 hours because there is no muscle inside the finger so it can you can delay it up to 12 hours even or even more than that that is the first thing that time second is what was the times are relative you you need to consider whether it is good or not so that is if it is a clean cut amputation definitely an indication for replantation now the third is in what way was that part preserved that is was the what was the warm ischemia time now we need to consider all these even after all this there is a final say the amputated part when the patient presents to you with an amputation the amputated part is x-rayed and then taken inside the theater and be dissect under microscope to see what is the injury to the vessel there are certain telltale signs on the vessel that show that the vessel has been injured even distally in those situations it may not be possible to replant it however if the vessel looks good distally you can replant it even proximally if the vessel is not good there are many techniques by which you can replant it but if the vessel is not not good in the distal which help you decide whether you can replant it or not does that answer your question yes sir thank you sir yeah dr jordan you want to ask something uh yes sir uh, i um, i really enjoyed the class but then in between there was a lot of disturbance so i really could not go to the class totally i just okay. wanted to ask sir that uh so you would be talking on replant as a separate topic yeah. you will be touching on that topic again sir yeah i will be touching on the the nitty gritty of replantation nitty gritty you know? so we'll, uh, uh, we will yeah yes sir yeah because uh, actually it is not part of the uh, the schedule that i've given but i can always right, because sir. i have given a uh, uh, buffering of one or two classes if you want right, whatever you are if you feel that it would be good to have a class on uh, replantation see what right. we need to talk about replantation is uh, what do you do i mean how do you set up the teams what is the logistics of doing it and what are the steps the the sequential steps in which you do the procedure and uh, how do you assess it afterwards and what yes, is the of the protocol these are the things that we will uh, now replantation and revascularization as you know right, uh, revascularization is something like i showed you know where the the parts are still attached but they not not viable so go be replanted 
So I think if you feel that we, it would be interesting to have a class, it would be useful, definitely you can have a class on replantation. Right, so that would be really nice. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? We can come on video if somebody wants to raise a hand, please. Yeah, I think if there are no questions, uh, then you know we'll close the session, sir. Thank you so much uh, for taking so much effort and uh, making the hand surgery so very interesting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.